When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Grease Goblin YouTube channel. Today's video, we are going to be talking about the Brotherhood without banners in the Winds of Winter. This is what you guys voted on, what you guys wanted to see. I was very surprised this one won over Illyrio and Sansa, but it is a unique one. It's one we don't really cover too much. I usually kind of loop them into like a Lady Stoneheart video type thing, but they're going to get their own video today. We'll talk about a little bit about Lady Stoneheart because there are some questions that are involved with the character. But for the most part, this is more about them as a whole. But I did want to say a thank you to the people that participated in this video and they asked questions. So if you did want to be a part of these, asking whatever questions on these type of uh, Winds of Winter videos, follow the Instagram and also look out for those community posts that I put up for the, the week's video. And also a thank you to the Patreons and members that support this channel. If you did want to become one, you do get videos early and I will be starting exclusive content in the future, especially in the summer. So... Let's get into the video and talk about the Brotherhood without banners. So the first question comes from Taylor. Why are they following Lady Stoneheart? It seems like she's in charge. Yeah, she's definitely in charge at this point. Now, this is for multiple reasons. One, given her status, right? She's Catelyn Tully and or Stark. She commands a lot of respect from these people, given Ned Stark was kind of the person that put them out on this mission or a lot of them and so she's gonna have a lot of influence over a lot of the members already and then the second part of it is going to be think about the way she's brought back to life so she's going to be looked at as kind of like a religious symbol or magic symbol she's come back from the dead in front of all of their eyes think about again a comparison would be like jesus christ right it is said in the bible that he is arisen that he comes back think about the way that that's lived on the or the influence that has spread in part because of that so you look at that and you put that with stoneheart and the first hand account a lot of these people are going to have on seeing her rise from the dead even though she should have she should be dead she has a cut deep into her throat she was dead for a bit of time she was just floating in a river it all adds up to this idea that she is somewhat of a magical figure, a figure that is is beyond belief. And so you have that aspect of it. Then the other aspect of it is Beric, who was in charge of the Brotherhood with Ban Out Banners, had the respect of all of these people to name him as their leader. He was also the leader because of Ned Stark, but still. And so he gives his life for Lady Stoneheart. Well, all of those people are going to go, OK, well, that was the passing of the torch. This is who Beric wanted to be in charge of them if he gave his life so that she could come back that meant that he believed she had a higher purpose to play still and that's also backed up by the fact that it would have believed that the lord of light brought her back so all of that kind of culminates to this figure of lady stoneheart who even outside of her being resurrected is a hugely influential figure but then you add the fact that she also is this figure of a really big religion uh, a really big religious figure given that most of the brotherhood without banners believe in the lord of light all of that culminates to this person that should be in charge given all the information we know ashley says this is more of a brotherhood observation whenever thoros brings Beric back we're, ne we we're never told that he has to sacrifice anyone to do it almost makes me think that if mel sacrifices shireen to save john it'll be unnecessary i really love this idea because we see this idea quite a lot with mel mel is someone that has preached that king's blood is very important that is what will grant stannis all these powers but we know that's not true we know, given that something like Mance, for instance, he wasn't burned, he was saved by Mel. We know that in reality, what really has power is just blood. Blood sacrifices, that's what seems to have some sort of power for Stannis. And so, in terms of Mel always jumping to conclusions, I like this idea, right? It would add a lot of tragic stuff onto Shireen's death. Outside of it, just Shireen being a child, being very innocent, being a very good-hearted character, it would really add to that level of tragedy. It would be something that Mel, when you think about if when she runs into Thoros, maybe later down the road, which is, we have some questions about that as well, that would be really an interesting conversation where it's like, wait, you burned a little girl so and John came back? Like, that was the rationale? Interesting, because on two accounts, she's going to be wrong. She's going to burn Shireen because she's 
of course, King's blood, but also two, because she believes that you need a sacrifice to bring back John, if that's why she ends up burning Shireen. So all of that culminates into this moment where Mel could have a really big moment of self-discovery, right? Doubting herself quite a lot. It could be that point in the story where Mel kind of switches up everything she's doing and tries to really focus on what, how to fight the others and try to get past all the mistakes that she's made and atone for those sins. I really like that idea though, Ashley. Kitty Kit or Kitty Kit uh, says, do you think Thoros tried to give the last kiss to their other fallen brothers after he revived Beric? Do you think he gives a part of himself when he revives Beric? This is an interesting question. I don't think that Thoros gives a bit of himself to revive Beric. I think that's an interesting question though. Like, what if that was the case? But another case is like, is Thoros trying to revive others outside of just Beric? And I'd like to think that we don't know this again in the books. We haven't been given any information, but I would like to think so. Like, I would like to think if you're in Thoros's position, you're seeing all these other people around you dying. You're going to try it at least a couple times or maybe once or twice. But that leads to the question is like, if he is not being able to bring back all these other people, but he's able to bring back Beric, but then Beric gives his life for Lady Stoneheart, Thoros is left in a position where it's like, okay, so my purpose was to bring back Beric, but then Beric then saved Stoneheart. So should my allegiance be to Stoneheart? Like fully? Because that's what the Lord of Light seems to be destining me for to do. I think all of that brings up a lot of interesting questions to the character of Thoros and his motivations going forward. But also, you say, also just a take, not a question. I think Beric's death was a mercy. He already lost too much of himself. He even asked if Thoros was his mother. He's another version of what is life when everything else is lost. He was a good knight and deserves some peace. Yeah, I mean, think about Beric from when we first meet him in a Game of Thrones till when he dies. We first meet him, he's this young, handsome knight that Sansa and Jane Poole are kind of, you know, I guess eyeing up um, because he's very handsome, especially Jane Poole. She really likes him. And by the end of it, it's like he's kind of a broken man. He's losing bits and pieces of himself. He's damaged. He has injuries everywhere. It almost seems like a mercy kill, right? And that's something we're going to see quite a lot with that storyline. So I think the tying in of, you know, Beric dying because of mercy, right? His purpose was served. And having Lady Stoneheart possibly die from a mercy killing from her daughter because Stoneheart has become this person that's not even Catelyn anymore. This being of just revenge and all these horrible atrocities she may cause in the future. I really liked a lot of your guys' ideas, by the way. Uh, Bowel says... Which lords do you think are allies with them? It could be a Red Wedding 2.0. So let's talk about this. I already wanted to look up uh, what we have down already. For, so for the Wiki of Ice and Fire, some of the people that we know already that are kind of sympathizing with the Brotherhood, we do have Ravella Swan from Acorn Hall. We have Lord Lyme Leicester. So there are people that are like very sympathetic. And you got to think about this as well. If you're someone that believes the Blackfish will end up finding the Brotherhood Without Banners and being someone that helps along with the Red Wedding 2.0 and things like that, you got to think, right? I don't think any houses will be publicly supporting them, but privately. You know, it's very similar to the first Blackfire Rebellion where it's like none of the major houses really took their side or took um day and blackfire's side but could they have been maybe aiding him secretly possible we just don't know and so i think the blackwoods could be a house that could be trying to back the brotherhood there could be other houses as well uh the malisters if they're able to get free of the phrase control there's a lot of houses in i think in the riverlands that could be backing them but it would be more secretly it wouldn't be like a public type thing until after the phrase have kind of been put out of power it's kind of what i believe Task asks, is Lem Lemon Cloak the Knight of Skulls and Kisses and aka Richard Lawnmouth? This is an interesting question because so Richard Lawnmouth or Lawnmouth, for people that don't know, was a companion of Rhaegar Targaryen. He was kind of in that era of just companions with like John Connington, Arthur Dane. He was in that kind of a group. And the issue that I have with this theory is Richard Lawnmouth does not have much to go off of his character. We don't know really anything about him. Um, he seems like this figure that was like a 
almost like a fable of the time. And so there's not a lot we know of the character. One thing we don't know about the characters, we don't know which side he took. We don't know if he stayed loyal to our Baratheon or if he you know, went with the Targaryens. I would lean towards him with the Targaryens, given that he was a big fan of Rhaegar, but who knows? But again, we don't know really anything about the two. Like, we don't know how old Lem really is. We don't know how old Richard Lawnmouth is at the time of, like, Robert's Rebellion. We'd have to assume he's probably a similar age of Rhaegar. So that would put him in, like, his mid, like, 40s, anywhere in that area, or maybe 30s, or like around how like old Ned is in the books. Again, there's just not a lot to go off of. The what I will say about this idea is there are some interesting things to point to with Lem Lemon Cloak, where in the books, there's kind of multiple times that seems to imply like kisses and skulls in terms of Lemon or Lem. We also have some things where his sigil kind of represents a bit of what Richard Lawnmouth would kind of be. And so I think it's an interesting theory. I don't think like it's a bad idea at all. I just don't think there's a ton to back it up because the two characters are so unknown in their origins and what ends up happening to Richard Lawnmouth specifically. So personally, again, I think it's possible. I just don't really have like a hard opinion on that one. Bill Joe asks, how do you think Stoneheart will meet back up with Sansa? I think it will almost certainly happen, but I don't know how. So to me personally, if you're going to suggest Sansa meets back up with Stoneheart, you have to be assuming that Stoneheart is going to get through all the Red Wedding 2.0 stuff, the stuff with the phrase, and then basically end up start going back up north to meet up, whether that be with Jon and the Northern Conflict or any of that stuff to take out the Boltons. The problem I have with this is I don't feel like a character like Stoneheart will make it that far. I think it makes much more sense that Arya will be the one that ends up meeting up with her and killing her before Sansa meets her. Because Sansa has so much plot going on that if we even saw Sansa and Stoneheart meet up, it'd probably be around the back quarter of the book. And so at that point, it's like you'd have to either resolve the Stoneheart stuff at the back end of Winds of Winter very quickly or you would have to do it in the next book i think it makes way more logical sense to have Arya almost repeat her history where she ends up being too late to the red wedding and in the second time she's also too late to stop this revenge red wedding the atrocities happening for people that are innocent being killed because of some of the crimes of the phrase but this time she's not late enough to find the culprit. She finds her mother. She interacts with her mother one last time and sees what she is and kills her. I think that will be a really great arc for Arya. And so I don't think Sansa's arc is tied to Catelyn. I think Arya's is at this time. I'm also not sure what Sansa would get out of like this whole meeting her mother arc. I think it's much more powerful for Arya. Sansa... I don't know, it would be interesting to see, like, I guess for Sansa to react to her mother becoming that, but I don't think it would hit as hard as it would for, like, an Arya, and the way Arya would be able to resolve that plot. I really feel like Sansa's arc is focused on taking out Littlefinger, and I think Arya's arc will be focused more on revenge, death, her mother. How do all these things operate within Arya? That's kind of pivotal to her arc. I think Sansa is more focused on a Littlefinger type thing. Now, it would also be interesting if Stoneheart meets up with Sansa because that could help unveil some of the things going on with Littlefinger. Remember, Callan did learn that like Littlefinger kind of lied to her and said some of those things. So, Callan could or Lady Stoneheart could be someone that could help Sansa, but I think that's for Sansa to do alone. I don't think it's needed for Lady Stoneheart to come into that arc for Sansa. Pablo says or asks, will the Stoneheart faction of the Brotherhood head north and will Stoneheart pass on the gift of life to Jon Snow? No. So right away, the issue with that idea is, I guess you're saying that the way Jon gets revived will be because of Stoneheart. My issue with this and the reason I don't think it makes sense is that would have to happen at the very end of Winds of Winter. Because Lady Stoneheart has her own, like, thing going on in the Riverlands. It's going to at least span, I think, half the book. I think it's once again going to parallel the first Red Wedding. The first Red Wedding happens, like, around the midpoint of A Storm of Swords. Kind of the early half. Kind of around that, like, right before the half point of A Storm of Swords. Because the rest of the book then focuses on the fallout 
of the red wedding so i think that's got what's going to be here where it's like around the middle point we'll end up seeing the revenge red wedding or the red wedding 2.0 i know some people have never heard that saying but i like it so i don't care but but i will say if that all happens it's still going to take a long time for them to then travel to the north to actually find john's body all of this would take a while right so john would have to be dead for a long time i don't think that really makes sense for the story i think if john's going to be revived it's going to be within that first like quarter to a third of the book with mel that kind of seems where that kind of thing is going but on your other part of this will the stoneheart faction of the brotherhood head north that i think is very logical right i think given the fact that the brotherhood without banners I think a lot of them would be seeing themselves as needing to atone for some of the crimes that they've done, how they've lost their way, how kind of Thoros kind of talks to Brienne and that part of it. I think the way that they will get atonement for that will be against the others, right? The Lord of Light guiding them against the, the Long Night. I think that makes logical sense. I think the one thing that the show did right is... I do think the Brotherhood Without Banners would see the others as a huge threat, and I think it would be something that they would take on as a responsibility for them to face. I don't like the way that that storyline ended in the show, but I think they had the right idea, and so I think that will be similar in the books as well. Uh, Casper asks an interesting question. Who would win the Brotherhood with Banners or Brotherhood Without Banners? Well... I don't know how to answer that question because you would assume the Brotherhood with Banners would maybe be more honorable and such and so the brotherhood without banners would be more of a guerrilla type warfare so if they both have the same amount of forces i'm gonna go with the brotherhood without banners i don't know i don't know how to answer that question but yeah uh jack says or asks will they disband after killing the phrase no i don't think they will or if they do it'll be like they're integrated into like the riverland army or like they'll maybe for some of their crimes take the the black but they're still going to be a part of the army going north to the others i think that is the natural way that the brotherhood without banners goes Matthew asks, does Thoros contribute to the battle against the others, or will he perish in the Riverlands? The way he died in the show always felt weird to me, even if he wasn't a main character. Yeah, the thing that I really disliked about the show was they didn't really handle Thoros and Beric in a way that I think was good. I think the way that we look at this and we go, okay, Thoros and Beric, they seem to have some higher purpose. Now, Beric seems to be to bring back Stoneheart for some other purpose whether that's to get the phrase out of the way so that everyone's united against the others what is you know whatever this being's power of how we keep bringing back characters what is his purpose or what is their purpose in actually doing this and so thoros i think will have a role to play against the others i think he will be someone that will fall in the fight against them and i think he is going to be a character that's going to struggle with what his purpose is i think he's going to find that in the war against the others and that's what his purpose is going to be and i think that is what he's going to go with hopefully he gets a better send-off than what we saw in the show also i don't think he's going to perish in the revelance i don't think his story is going to end there uh jamie asks will the brotherhood without banners get drawn to the north by lady stoneheart who's the next leader of the brotherhood without banners so i don't think it's gonna be lady stoneheart Maybe that's Lady Stoneheart's wish, but I don't think she's going to be, she's going to live to actually do that. But I do think they will. I've kind of explained it a few times down this video, so I won't explain it another time. But yes, I do think they will end up going north. Who's the next leader of the Brotherhood Without Banners? I think a logical decision would be Thoros, but if they are just under someone else, like the Blackfish, Jon Snow, I think all that would be logical as well. Uh, Larissa asks, how do you think Mel will impact the Brotherhood in the Endgame? So, the bro so Mel, I think, will be a character that is going to be very similar to Thoros. There are going to be two characters searching for purpose, right? Because I think similar to the way the show did it, Jon is not going to have Mel around if he burns Shireen. That's just not something that's going to happen. And especially with Davos around, we know that Mel is not going to be in high favor if she's not just straight up executed. I don't think that's going to be the case either. But I think Mel and Thoros specifically... We'll kind of come to terms together, have these conversations about maybe some of the errors that they've made in the past, how things have gone down. I think both will really refocus on this idea of the long night and how they have to defend the wall and discover those ways of defeating the others. I think that will be a really big impact. I think Mel could be someone that could help focus the Brotherhood Without Banners if they're not already focused. Maybe they're just a band of men that are kind of following the Riverlands at this time under the Blackfish and Mel kind of is coming south, talks to Thoros and goes, yeah, this is happening. The others are coming, 
and kind of does that type of deal. I like that idea. I think Mel could impact them in that way. Uh, and then the last question I have is from user JY, and you say, how do you see the Brotherhood Without Banner story ending in wins? I think what they're going to end up doing is kind of atoning for some of their faults, some of their killing of innocence, um, doing things that were not justified or loyal or, or honorable. I think they will have one of two outcomes. I think the first outcome will be they will give their lives defending against the others in the Great War. The other side of it, I think, could be they end up at the wall, um, taking the black. Now, that's going to change depending on how the story ends. You know, if there is still a wall, if there is still a threat of the others, then that could change. Maybe they could go into some sort of other servitude type thing, uh, atoning for some of their mistakes and things like that. But yeah, thank you guys for all watching. Thank you guys for everyone that participated in this. I did really enjoy. I like talking about some of the things we don't really talk about too much on this channel. Um, it kind of freshens it up for me personally. And I hope you guys all enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.